so today we are going to talk a little bit about uh, insecticide seed treatments and how uh, it uh, increases or doesn't affect maybe uh, uh, plant uh, yields and even uh, uh, economic, uh, economic uh, increases. This is a kind of a mega-analysis also that they did uh, on several southern states including uh, <clears throat> Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Tennessee. So they studied during 10 years the yields and the economic returns when they use uh, treated seeds with insecticides on soybeans and untreated seeds. So um, this is grouping all the data for all the states together. So what, uh, what indicates this study is that during five years, there were have, have impacts of this. They have impacts. There were significant uh, differences uh, that were higher when they used the uh, seed treatments. And these were done in 2006, 2007, 8, 11, 12. And in 2014, there were not significant impact. So you can see here, there was a very similar uh, uh, yields and also the economic returns. So in addition to that, there was other years that they, the yield treatment didn't affect that stuff. So this is grouping all this data together. Now, <clears throat> if we move that to uh, state by state data, so they partitioning this also state by state data, we can see that there's some increases. So the southern you go, the increase is higher. The northern you are moving, these increases are lower. So let's see, for example, here in Mississippi, and Louisiana, these are Gulf states. So you can see that there's a yields that are 6% and 7%, whereas the yields on the Arkansas and Tennessee is 4 and 2% only. So these yields are significant on the upper states, even in Arkansas, but in, in, in even in Tennessee. But when you see the returns, the economic returns, Again, that decreases for those states. And <clears throat> for Arkansas and Tennessee, they're not that impact of the seed treatments. So what's happening there? So why is that there's this movement from the uh, effects of seed treatments from the northern, from the southern area to the northern area? Most likely it's due to the high pressure of insects that they have in the Gulf states. So probably this, uh, they have many insects. So this probably affect the early pests. But when you move to the north areas, there is some information from Iowa, Pennsylvania, Nebraska, that those effects are not proved in corn and soybeans. So that's something that probably we need to investigate. My question is for you all, is Kentucky a southern or northern state? <laughs> so it's a, we're, we're midway. So they were midway geographically, so basically we can have some pests that people in the, in the south has, but maybe we also don't have that many pests. So we're getting a very interesting location. So, and, uh, so in soybeans and in corn, the seed treatments have been used for maybe 20 years, 15 years so far. Whereas in wheat, that's not being uh, that long, maybe 10 years, I'm not so sure. Uh, besides that, also, um, we are using pyrethroids to control aphids, aphids that are vectors of barrier dwarf viruses. So last year, I'm going to show you only this picture because last year where there was this farmer and this was on barley, they have higher population of aphids. And this was two locations, actually. One was Christian County and the other was in Todd County. And in these locations, when you walk into the field, the threshold was 10 aphids per foot long row that you sample. That's the threshold. So once you have that threshold, you can, you can spray the pyrethroid. But this uh, farmer had probably 400, 500 for that small space. So there was a big number of aphids. Happily for him, uh, when I noticed the first time, this aphids has this kind of white spots there. And that was fungus that were affecting these aphids. So after one week, this population of aphids 
basically were wiped out by this fungus. And also, in addition, we have some uh, natural enemies, uh, parasitoids, that were uh, successful in that. So to have this kind of population, so especially this kind of fungus, we need to have kind of very special uh, season. It's not, it's not going to happen all the time. So we require, for example, high humidity in the morning and at night and also lower temperatures. So maybe that's not going to happen this year, so, but it means that's something that happens. So. Now, uh, I'm going to show you some data on, on seeded, treated, uh, and untreated wheat, as well as the insecticide seed treatments. Okay, this is 2016, 2017, and here you cannot probably see that one, but we have very low numbers of aphids last year here in the research station. And then we have also treated seed pioneer, and treated pioneer, and treated Cavendish. So we have those three varieties. So here, if you look here, first in this side, that's too far, but the number of aphids here that we have, the highest number of aphids here, when we did a spray, was three aphids per root. So we didn't even do the threshold. We didn't get a threshold here. But that's something that's a common practice here in Kentucky. Uh, they do the spray even before doing counting aphids, but because you are using some fertilizers or maybe you are using some herbicides, you, are, you try to do that stuff. And because the price for uh, pyrotros are really cheap. So anyway, well, after we did the spray in general, there was a little increase in the first uh, group of treated seeds, but in general there was a decrease of population. So by the end of the uh, probably 20 days, most of the aphids were gone. Now it comes here, the very interesting part that deals with the yields, and this is based on the untreated and treated seeds. So although these are the same variety, there was really a not big increase on the treated and untreated seeds. So uh, they were very similar actually. And even uh, the issue was here that for some reason when we have the low dose of betroid, the numbers were really very low, were in the control were high. So that was the only point that we have significant differences. I cannot explain what happened there. Maybe we didn't, uh, we do some, 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 some yell over here, but I'm not so sure what happened. So that, that's something I cannot explain. But in general, in all, in all the other untreated and treated seeds, there were no significant differences. In addition to that also is that these numbers of aphids were very low compared to, the, to what they are required to be controlled. So maybe there were some other effects that I didn't take in consideration here. Okay. Now, this is something that is, uh, we are doing currently here. This is a, a study of, of, of different pyrethroids to control aphids but also we are using untreated versus treated seeds, okay? So and we are doing that because with the high numbers of aphids in this population uh, in Todd County last year, there, will, there may be a possibility that there were some resisting, insecticide resistance. And that's what we are trying to do with this study. So, so although here we use the, the, the high rates of warrior, mustang, and betroid, so we have seen that we did a pre-count, and in this case, the pre-count was higher than we did the last year. So the last year, the previous year was around three, here it went to six, and even here we're around that number. So a little low on the, on the, on the treated seed. This represents the counts after one day after application. You can see that in all cases, there was a decrease, except in the control. Of course, in the control, we didn't use any insecticide, so the populations continue up. And this is four days or three days after the application, and there was a big reduction on the aphid population. So there are two things that are important here, is that uh, these products probably are working effectively well here in Kentucky. I believe that there is no resistance, although I have a colony of aphids in the lab that I need to test further that. That, okay. Um, so in that sense, we are okay. Now, look into this graph, the small one here, and this is uh, the sampling that we do with uh, with uh, uh, a project that we have with Dr. Bar Bradley on detecting uh, uh, barley yellow dwarf barley dwarf yellow viruses, and then we can see 
that in 2016, in the fall of 2016, when we did the sampling, we didn't find any plants that were with the disease. So we, we have the plants, we send for a laboratory, they come and there's no disease. Now, in the spring, around that, this time of the year, 50% of the plants were with the disease. And this is in spite of the lower number of aphids we have. So considering that, maybe for that reason, it's necessary to use the pyrethroids. But even that, maybe the, we need to work a little bit more on the threshold. So maybe the threshold is not 10, maybe it's a little lower. We don't need, we need to do that. So and there's no study have that been done in that sense here in, in Kentucky. So uh, in 2017, in the fall, we did again that stuff, the same sampling, and again, zero returns with the positives, so no barley, barley yellow dwarf virus, but uh, we are not uh, completed the, the, the search for this year yet. So most likely it's going to happen this one or maybe even higher because we have higher number of aphids here. Now, uh, there's that, this is something that people are worried about that and this is slugs. So we have some uh, funds from the Kentucky Soybean Board and we are doing this research for that with, with, this, um, with this, this, this project. So in this case, uh, we have a, uh, uh, we are not doing the research on soybeans, but we are doing all the way as a double crop system. And this is done in irrigated plots. So we have a lot of water there and we are having a lot of water because slugs like high mo mo moisture. So it's, that's the reason we are doing that. So it's something different that you are doing in your farms, but still we have an area, we have an area here that we don't have irrigation and we did a sampling here. So and this is what we have here. So, so we have a non-irrigated and irrigated. And then we try different uh, baits. We try beer, wine, hot dog, and so on. So I'm not using the money for buying buy wine or beer, but this is coming from the students, actually. My one of students like to be, drink beer, <laughs> as maybe you all. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so, but beer, it seems that they, they like beer. So, and they like beer, they like uh, uh, dog food, and also this is the pitfall trap. So, what's interesting with this one, I said, there's more information on wheat on that pamphlet that I provide you. Uh, so, you read that a little bit, and uh, I think my, my um, information to you is that Right now, you don't need to worry about wheat because the moment that these slugs are affecting wheat is usually when they're germinating. So they can, the slugs can feed on the embryo. So when the, plant, when the seeds are start to becoming uh, ready to emerge, that's when they start to attack. So and that's, uh, that's not happening here because if the plants are really high. I saw my plants and I haven't seen any damage from slugs. The slugs probably are eating something else, maybe some of the weeds there, but that's what is happening. So anyway, if you want to use any product to control slugs on wheat, you want to waste your money. Uh, this is the only product we have. We have a slago. And the slago is, uh, this is the price, $130, $140 for 40 pounds. So basically, if you have a 10 acre field, for a low rate of slago, you need to use $347. For the high rate, 44 pounds per acre, that's a $1,500. Okay. So although I'm going to write something more about soybeans, in soybeans and that the information that I provide you there, we have only uh, two products. This is slag also with the same rates for, for, for soybeans. And then we have a metaldehyde. And the price for metal dehyde using the rate that's 10 pounds per acre is $26. So it's still expensive. <coughs> so, but this is a project that uh, we are conducting. Um, another important thing that I forget to tell to the other people is that the, it seems that there is an effect of the seed treatments on, la, on the predators of the slugs. So the predators of slugs are uh, carabids, they are the ground beetles that feed on, sl on slugs, 
and it seems that there is an effect on that. So that's something that we are uh, going to study here also.